Hello everyone, my name is Leslie Franco and I will be doing my novel presentation over the female quixotism. Um, and here is a cover of what the book looks like. I'm going to focus more of the camera on the presentation so you're able to follow along and let's get started. So we're going to start with a little overview of the book. So here is how I got this picture from the internet and this is an, how the book looks like. And the title is The Female Quixotism. The author is Tabitha Gilman Tinney, and it was published in 1801. The genre is romance, and it is a parody of the work of Cervantes' Don Quixotope. So here's a little biography over uh, Tabitha Gilman Tinney. And right here, I attached an image of what seems to be her. And according to Encyclopedia, I uh, wanted to get a little bit more information over her uh, life story. And she was born in 1762 at Exeter, New Hampshire. She was raised in Puritan traditions and in a Puritan household. And she had, a, she had love for reading and writing. And in 1788, she married Samuel Tinney and they had no kids. Um, I included uh, Samuel Tinney because he has a major role, I believe, in uh, the female quixotism. So I'll explain that a little bit in the next slide. Um, and again, the female quixotism is Tinney's most popular novel. She wrote it while her husband was in Congress. And like I mentioned, Tinney, he was a part of the Federalist Party. So he was a Federalist, Federalist uh, representative and he served for three uh, terms. She moved back to Exeter, New Hampshire after her husband's death in 1816. She died May 2nd, 1837 due to an illness. So she was around 75 years uh, old when she died. So before I dive into the plot, I wanted to first uh, talk about the main characters just so you are able to understand how uh, each character's role plays um, an important part in the plot. So the main character of, um, is Dorcasina Sheldon. She is the daughter of Mr. Sheldon. She is a hopeless romantic and she is very naive. So right here is Dorcasina Sheldon. The picture has no content of what she looked like. It's just so you can associate the name with um, a gender. Next, we have Mr. Sheldon. Um, he is a wealthy man and very reserved. He is the father of Dorcasina. And he loves and cares for his daughter very much. The next character we're going to talk about is Betty. Uh, she's uh, Miss Sheldon's servant. She's very loyal to Miss uh, Sheldon. However, she's ignorant and superstitious. And you'll see how um, her ignorance and superstition kind of feeds into Darkasina's um, false beliefs in romance and how she kind of encourages that behavior. And the first um, suitor we're going to talk about is Lysander. So the first suitor of uh, Dorcasina, and he truly loved Dorcasina, but was rejected. Uh, the reason as to why he was rejected is because he was plain and um, non-romantic. As I said, uh, Dorcasina is a hopeless romantic, so she envisions love to be um, how the romance novels describe them, and because Lysander didn't was not romantic, she didn't feel that was, that's what, that's what love was. Um, the next main character I want to talk about is Patrick O'Connor. So he was a very symbolic character. He was, um, an, he was an Irish immigrant. And the reason why he was symbolic is because after Lysander, every one of her suitors represented the, uh, low class, low income class. And during this time, they posed a threat for the, um, American government which was run under the Federalist and they believed in a strong central government and they wanted it to be run they wanted the government to be ran by rich wealthy educated individuals and every single one of these suitors posed a threat because they did not meet the status quo of this rich wealthy educate, educated men um, he had self-intended motives he was an antagonist slash villain because he had ill motives towards Storkasina um, the next character we're going to talk about is John Brown. He, I don't consider him to be one of the main characters, but he was important because uh, at some point he was close to marrying Dorcasina. So he was an imposter. He fakes to be something his, he's not. 
Uh, almost every single one of these suitors lies to Dirk Casina saying they're wealthy and they're a well-established um, man. However, every single one of them is just trying to get a hold of her money. And again, he had self-intended motives. He was an antagonist and a villain because he was trying to take advantage of Dirk Casina's, uh, you know... Ro you know, sense of romantic, you know, beliefs and what romance was. And they offered her the romance, but only because they wanted her money. The last one we're going to talk about was Seymour. And he went broke and he wanted power and money, which is why he was going after Dork Casina. He also had self-intended motives. He was Dork Casina's last suitor. And he's also an antagonist and a villain because, like I said, he wanted to take advantage of the fact that Dorcasina was very naive and a hopeless romantic in order to get a hold of her estate and money. So now I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the plot of the story now that I kind of went a little bit over the characters. So the exposition is the very beginning of the story and how it opens up. So uh, Mr. Sheldon is a wealthy man who lives in Delaware with his daughter um, Dorcas. Delaware is in the north, so I want you to keep that in mind because that will play a major role later on. Um, Mr. Sheldon's wife dies when Dorka is three years old and is left to take care of her. Dorka loves to read romantic novels. And like I said, this is kind of the start of her hopeless romantic journey where she has this these set ideals of what romance is and how love should be displayed. Um, Dorka changes her name to Dorka Sina when she turns 18 years old. She feels that her name Dorka doesn't attract men and, you know, she changes her name because she wants to attract suitors. Um, next I want to talk about the rising action. So, um, Mr. Sheldon's old friend, uh, son. So his old friend sends him a letter saying that his son is going to pay him a visit, which is Lysander. He's from Virginia, which is from the South. Very important also to know. Um, so Lysander will pay a visit to Mr. Sheldon and Dorcasina uh, a visit. Dorcasina imagines a romantic fairy tale with Lysander. Lysander falls in love with Dorcasina. Dorcasina rejects Lysander due to his lack of romance. So this is, I feel like, is very important because as you will notice... Lysander is the only one that truly falls in love with Dorcasina for who she is and not because of her money. Uh, that is also because Lysander comes from a wealthy family as well. His family owns slaves, which is where they get their wealth from. And Dorcasina rejects him because, again, she has this preconceived notion of how love should be expressed. And because Lysander is very plain and unromantic, you know, she's like, this is not what love is and rejects him completely. Okay. So now let's talk about the climax. So an Irish immigrant named Patrick O'Connor tries to pursue Dorcasina. And O'Connor is untruthful to Dorcasina for uh, his own self-interest. Um, O'Connor comes from, um, you know, the low uh, income class. Therefore, when he finds out Dorcasina has money, you know, he wants to uh, acquire that wealth and estates to build a name for himself. Um, O'Connor and Dorcasina meet for the first time and um, through this course O'Connor is uh, telling Dorcasina lies that he's a well-established man all in order just again to get uh, just to get Dorcasina to fall in love with him. Lysander sends a letter to expose O'Connor's lies. Uh, Mr. Sheldon suspects O'Connor has um suspects O'Connor's intentions towards Dorcasina. So the, the father is very aware that many men will try to pursue Dorcasina because of the wealth and estates that uh, the family owns. So um, the falling action. So how does this kind of play out? Because one thing that I noticed about romance novels, it, um, especially with this one, she does have a lot of men after her for that same reason that they want her money. Um, so the following action, uh, Dorcasina realizes O'Connor's intentions and discovers his lies. So I believe um, she discovers this by finding out that he's uh, a criminal and kind of realizes that everything that he's told her was just a lie, was just because he wanted um, her money, essentially. Uh, Dorcasina has several suitors. Um, like I said, um, the plot could have been much longer because each one has a unique story to them, but there was Captain Barry, Mr. Cumberland, John Brown, and even with Captain Barry, like, there was um, 
I mean, each one of them has like their own specific um, story, but I just kind of wanted to make this presentation a little bit shorter. So then I'm gonna uh, miss uh, once um, Mr. Sheldon passes away, um, their their neighbors, Mr. and Mrs. Stanley, uh, kind of look over um, Dorcasina. But at this age, Dorcasina's around maybe in her 30s, I would say. So Mr. Stanley, I mean, Mrs. Stanley persuades Mary not to marry John Brown. John Brown is a, a country boy. He, again, has no money and is only pursuing Dorcasina in order to get, um, you know, her possessions. And uh, Seymour is Dorcasina's last uh, suitor and lies to Dorcasina for his own personal gain. So again, we have like this common trend of everyone after Lysander is just kind of bad towards Dorcasina because they're taking advantage of her, you know, of her herself being so naive towards romance in order for their own personal gain. So the resolution, what ends up happening at the end um, Dorcasina never gets married, which is why I put a picture of, you know, this no, no to marriage. None of the suitors got a hold of her estates or wealth. Um, Dorcasina really realizes her unrealistic views um, in romance. She uses her wealth towards charity and to help others, which is why I put this uh, female empowerment. Because what I feel... Um, at the end, it was a wake-up call for her. So the female quote, quoticism... Um, so quoticism just kind of means ideals and beliefs. Uh, so I believe, so essentially the title of the book is female uh, ideals. So I, at the end, I feel like she realized romance, her way of thinking about romance was flawed and she used, you know, her privilege to really build herself and the community around her. So the historical background is very important to how, um, to this book. So this uh, book was written in 1801. So definitely this was during a time of post-revolution. So there was a lot of uncertainty uh, of America's government after the American Revolution. So like I said, once um, America got independence from Britain, you know, it was more now that they had gotten independence it was like, how are we going to run this country? So uh, Tinney's husband was um, a Federalist representative, so he was in the part of the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party believed in a strong centralized government. Um, definitely classism uh, was a big thing during this society. Rich and the well-educated controlled the, controlled the government during this time. Um, Dorcasina suitors were a threat to the Federalist Party. So this is the symbolic meaning behind um, her suitors. So the suitors, uh, you know, O'Connor, John Brown, um, I can't remember the other one. I, I just can't remember his name, I'm so sorry. It is Seymour. They were all part of a low class and were after Dorcasina's money. So, I'm so sorry. So um, this is from, an uh, somebody was analyzing the book and they said that, you know, the suitors represented uh, were where they represent or were composed of illiterate, poor, and not in not in a position to inherit property. So the Federalist Party did not want uh, low class citizens to have um, inherit property because when you inherit property, you have power. When you have power, you're able to control the government. So they definitely wanted to be elitist and control the government themselves. And also the historical background is the North versus the South. Like I said, um, Dorcasina was from Delaware, the North, and later on I'm going to talk about how in the book she mentions the reason, another reason why she rejected Lysander, who was from Virginia, the South, was on the ideology of slavery. Uh, Dorcasina did not believe in slavery and thought it was inhumane. However, Lysander gained his wealth through slavery. So that also plays a historical background uh, to the book. And... Uh, the major influences. So what kind of influences this book is ro is uh, during the era of romanticism. Um, you know, the reason why she wrote this book and why it influenced her to write it was because she wanted to war warn young ladies about the flawed beliefs in romance stories. You know, there was a very preconceived notion of how romance looks and how you portray those behaviors. And she was warning them not to follow that because that can lead to several consequences uh, like Dorcasina faced, you know. Um, then the Federalist Party. So Tinney's husband was in the Federalist Party, which was dominated between 1789 and 1801. 
and this book was you know published in um, 1801 so definitely you see you know the strong beliefs of the federalist party you know classism elitist you know running the government and how they didn't want a uh, low class um you know settlers to inherit property because then that would mean they would have you know some way of controlling the government and feminism for sure influences uh, is influenced in this book because it kind of reverses the gender roles and makes a woman the hero of the story so as you will notice notice later on um Dorcasina never married however she was the hero in her story she didn't need to marry someone in order for her to feel contempt or happy and in addition she realized her flawed views in romance you know and used her estates for for good so ultimately you know she's reversing the gender roles that you know a man is always the hero in the sense the woman is the hero and some of the themes that i noticed that were prevalent in this um in this uh, story was capitalism. I mean, for sure capitalism, because when we're talking about, you know, the building, the foundation of our uh, country is built on capitalism. You know, only the rich and the elitists wanted to run the government, and that's still prevalent to this day. And like I said, you know, we can talk about the Federalist Party, but we can also talk about how, uh, you know, Patrick O'Connor, John Brown, were all after, you know, Dorcasina's money. Every single one of her suitors was in pursuit of uh, obtaining her estates and her lands and her money because they wanted some sense of power. They wanted a sense of capital, you know? Um, the next thing I noticed, a theme, is illusion and disillusionment. So the illusion, Dorcasina had this big illusion about romance and she had illusions about how romance, you know, should look like. I remember in uh, page 10, um, in page 10, and I'm quoting it from the book, I'm reading it from my passage right here, and I'll, I'll turn the camera to me. Um, she says, um, she has this false belief or this illusion of what romance is, and it's, um, I'm going to quote it right now. All served to conform her in the opinion that he was the person decreed by the stars to become her husband. So right when, um, this is back to, this goes back to talking about how when, Lysander was going to come visit Dorcasina. You know, she had this illusion that, you know, this guy was sent from heaven and was going to be the love of her life and was going to be her husband. So she had this illusion because of the romance novels that she had. Because she's a hopeless romantic, you know, she formed this illusion, you know, that this is the guy she's going to marry. And she, you know, which is can be very detrimental. And the disillusionment, so the disbelief, you know, how does... How does she kind of like wake up from, oh my God, you know, my way of thinking about romance is flawed. Well, at the very end, uh, she has an epiphany. You know, uh, at the very end, she realizes her flawed way of thinking about romance. And I'm going to stay. Um, she writes a letter to Harriet. So Harriet ends up marrying uh, Captain, Captain Barry. Uh, she writes uh, a letter to Harriet and she says, I know, I now find the most sensibly, sorry, I now find and most sensibly feel the consequences of my ridiculously romantic and absurd contact. Conduct. I'm so sorry. So like I said, we have illusion and disillusionment and we also have empowerment. So like I said, um, definitely uh, Dorcasina was the hero in this um, novel because she realized her flawed way of thinking and turned her life around. So that was uh one of the themes so the literary devices satire so definitely satire is written all over this book you know she um what tinny tinny to tabitha tinny aims to do is to ridicule the danger the dangerous um ideals women have in romance so for instance i'm gonna quote again you know I'm going to quote, the, the same thing I'm going to quote is also for what I have under epiphany, but I feel like this quote just kind of puts the icing on the cake. You know, she says, again, when she writes the letter to Harriet, she says, I, I now find and most sensibly feel the consequences of my ridiculous, ridiculously romantic and absurd con conduct. So definitely she aims to ridicule how Dor Dorcasina and women who think like her, you know, the, their flawed way of thinking and how... Um, you know, it's not good. She has illusion. So, for instance, on page 10, when um, she finds out that Lysander is going to visit uh, her and her father, 
you know, she has this, you know, false belief and illusion that when he comes that, or the fact that he's even going to come, you know, all serve to conform her in the opinion that he was the person decreed by the stars to become her husband. So she has these illusions of what romance is, which kind of encourage her behavior. Uh, then we have irony. You know, it's very ironic how the story ends because Dorcasina ends up alone. For someone who, you know, the reason I think it's so ironic because she rejected Lysander because he was not romantic. But then all these other uh, men who were trying to win her over and were using, you know, romance never had good intentions for her. However, Lysander was truly, truly cared for her. And she rejected him, which was, which is ironic because she never ended up having this romantic fairy tale. Um, we have an epiphany because Dorcasina realizes her flawed views on romance, which is I just read. And the meaning, so what's the meaning behind this warning? You know, what she uh, Tini aims to do is she warns young ladies about the flawed ideals of romance and the next is female heroism. Dorcasina realizes her flawed way of thinking at the end, uh, and she empowers herself without the help of a man. And um, the last thing of uh, meaning is, at the end, Dorcasina, although she never married and never experienced that romance, she was still okay. Meaning that it, it also kind of shows that once post-revolution, people were wondering how was, how was the state of America going to be? And it kind of, I feel like the ending of this story aims to, you know, foreshadow that the, like, the way America is running its government will be okay post-revolution. So, um, what I, what I, what do I give this book? Um, when I was first, when I first read, um, the title, I didn't know what to expect because I didn't know what quoticism was. But after reading it, I want to give it a five out of five rating. Um, is this book, is this novel lit, literary? I recommend this book to every young lady because I know even in today's society, there's, you know, there's preconceived ways of how a woman should live her life. And I think, you know, the issues that, sh that Dorcasina faced in this um, novel are still relevant today. Uh, many women are still encouraged to marry and that's kind of like what you should do. You know, however, Dorcasina kind of like challenges the status quo on this. So I definitely recommend anyone to read it. It was really interesting. And I actually really liked, you know, the plot of the story. So for discussion, I have my discussion right here. And just, I'm, I'm going to read it. Um, so the discussion. The female quoticism reveals how women pursue their ideals uh, which can be flawed if they lose sight of reality. I feel that Dorcasina lost sight of reality because she was so, um, you know, focused on this romance, you know, fairy tale. So, um, you know, Dorcasina rejects her suitor Lysander due to his lack of romance. However, he was the only one that truly loved her, which makes this whole story kind of ironic because, she, like, again, she failed to see that. So that means that the way she interpreted these romance novels was not accurate and she lost sight of reality so um due to the preconceived notion Dorcasina has on love um you know so like i said um unless a man expresses romance like in the novels that she read she doesn't believe it's love or she doesn't you know that's what she wants out of life and for example um there's a time when uh, her father is sick and O'Connor, because he ha like he's greedy, he wants her money. He has the intentions of wanting to win her over. So he uses, uh, you know, he fakes this, you know, romance fairy tale because he's feeding O'Connor is feeding, you know, Dorcasina with what she wants. This, you know, sense of imaginary romance. And for example, um, I'm gonna quote the book, and it says O'Connor was a poor um, Irish man that lot. Well, I'm sorry, this is not quoting. This is me reading. Um, O'Connor was a poor Irish man that lied to Dorcasina in order to attain her wealth. Once, um once they married that was his plan uh he used his romantic charm to try to win her over and lysander um tries to expose o'connor however o'connor's charm has already blinded dorcasina so now it's when i'm going to quote it and um o'connor sends a letter to dorcasina which she finds so romantic and um the letter that lysander sent was pretty much trying to expose him so this is what this is how she views the scenario 
You see, Betty, she, said she, the difference between the letter and that of Lysander, the dear old Connor has a heart susceptible of genuine love. So she's already blinded by this fake romance story uh, with O'Connor that she fails to realize that O'Connor is only doing that for his own personal interest. Um, it takes several suitors and many failed attempts for Dorcasina to realize that the suitors that demonstrated romance, you know, that showed her, that gave her this, you know, fairy tale romance, only wanted her estates and money. Uh, this leads her to realize her uh, unrealistic views and romance and decides to empower herself and uh, the community. Uh, lastly, it's important to mention that the female quoxetism is heavily influenced by federalist ideals. Again, the reason why, it's because all the suitors, like O'Connor, uh, John Brown, these are the first ones that come to my mind, they, were, they all had negative uh, perceptions. They all had negative stereotypes, that they were poor, that they were bad, that they were criminals. So this is very much influ influenced by federalist ideals. That's why, they're, that's why these people are giving these negative stereotypes because of that. You know, classism is very prevalent in this book, and the negative perceptions of the lower class demonstrate a threat to the success of the American government. This mentality reflects our current social political climate. Rich are in charge of our gov government. There's negative views associated with lower class. Um, I also feel like this book challenges gender norms. Thor Casina never married and was content with that. Um, this demonstrated that Thor Casina did not need a man to handle her money or its states, and this is very important because during her time, men were very much in control of that it also showed sh uh, moral judgment towards slavery so the nor uh thought slavery was bad and dorcasina lived in delaware um dorcasina dorcasina mentioned her thought on slavery and how it was inhumane and just so i feel like you know there's a lot of things uh topics that are covered in this book and sh everyone should give it a read and here is my bibliography thank you and i hope you enjoyed this uh presentation i know it's a little long but um, I felt like this is what I needed to do in order to cover kind of like a whole book. But um, thank you for your time. Bye.